Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's lecture on problems with psychological continuity. In particular, I had you read something by philosopher Derek Barfit, where he takes a look at split, split brain scenarios and shows that psychological continuity can lead to some really weird and strange contradictions. So here we are asking the question, well, who am I? Remember, Descartes has this first truth that he says he knows for a certain that I exist. So what is that I? Right? What is that thing that persists through time? This is a question of numerical identity. And of course, we originally looked at this by thinking about the case of Tukey Williams. So in 1970, the person that uh, committed murders, what is it about that person that persists through time that allows us to say, yeah, in 2005, when Tukey Williams was executed, they executed the man that committed those murders? It's a question of personal identity. So, is it the body? Right? The body theory says um, the essential property is the living material body, that the same living material body persists through time. So you take a look at Tukey's fingerprints in 05, same fingerprints as 1970. You take a DNA sample, if you have some from 1970, same as the DNA that we uh, find in Tukey 2005. We say we take a look at Tukey, we see his face, we take a look at the photo, same person that we see in the photo from 1970. Um, these are all different ways of using the body theory to come up with an argument for why it's the same person. But of course, there are issues we brought up last time, right? Issues about the body theory. I mean, if it's DNA, your DNA is everywhere. So, you know, wherever a hair follicle is, is that where you are too? Uh, if you take off your fingerprints, are you no longer here? What percentage of the body still has to persist through time? Which body parts? There's lots of issues you have to address if you're a body theorist that make it seem like it's not who we are, right? For a lot of us, it's more intuitive especially philosopher John Locke, it's more intuitive to say, well, maybe it's our memory. The reason why we feel as if we are the same person right now that was here last time watching the previous lecture is because I remember <laughs> watching the previous lecture, right? The reason why Tukey in 05 is the same Tukey that committed the murders in 1970 is because if you ask him, hey, do you remember doing that? He'll go, yeah, I remember doing that. Maybe it's memory, says a philosopher like Locke. But we have some issues with memory, too. The same sorts of questions concerning what percentage of memory has to be there. And in particular, the question of, well, what if you don't remember? I mean, if you take a look at your baby photo from when you were born, in case your parents took that photo, well, do you remember being born? And if you don't, does that mean that is not you in the photo? If you don't remember what happened three days ago at 11 p.m., does that mean you did not exist three days ago at 11 p.m. because you have no memory of that time? So memory theory seemingly is, has its own issues. So how do we address those issues? Well, some people say it's the psychological continuity theory that we should believe in. In fact, maybe that's what we intuitively believe in, even though we may not say it out loud. And what's this theory? Well, instead of having to necessarily be directly tied to our previous self through memory, maybe it's enough to say, hey, we can find successive chains of previous selves that are all connected by memory. And because they're all part of this chain, we can say that was us way back when, even though we don't remember being that person, or we don't have any episodic memory of that time in our lives. If you're a psychological continuity theorist, you can make an argument, right, that you are the same person 2020 that was here in 1970 by saying something like the following. Tim in 2020 has a direct memory of being Tim in 1980. And second premise, well, Tim in 1980 has, that should be has, not as, has direct memory of being Tim in 1970. With psychological continuity, what we see is there is a chain of memories linking one stage to the other. 
So 2020 is tied to 1980, Tim, and 1980, Tim, is tied to 1970, Tim. So psychological continuity can conclude now that 2020, Tim, is numerically identical to 1970, Tim. Not because it has direct memory, not because Tim has direct memory now of being around in 1970, but because we can show that there is a continuity of links of memory, all right? from 2020, Tim, to 1970, Tim. So this is, an, this is the phrasing of the arguments that a psychological continuity theorist would make if they want to show that this person's the same as that previous person. So we don't have to remember what, uh, what happened when we were born, right? As long as that chain exists. So a lot of us go, yeah, that makes, that makes sense. That, that just makes sense to me. But then in the last lecture, we brought up this issue of a transporter, right? And if, and you remember the whole scenario with Star Trek, they have this device that beams you to another location, takes you, takes your matter, and then turns you into energy and beams you someplace else. You know, in the film, in the TV show, they do this all the time, and there's never a question, right? You step in the transporter, and then you step out, and it's still you. But then we brought up at the very end of the last lecture, the idea that what if that transporter was not a transporter, but instead a replicator? What if instead of transporting you someplace else, this machine takes a look at you, the way you're composed, constructed, the way that your atoms are put together, copies that pattern, right? Stores it, stores that pattern, that design, but then destroys you. All the matter that is you is gone. And in Venus, takes the atoms, takes the matter that's there, and then reconstructs you using what it gathered when it scanned you in the machine in the first place. Is that still you? And it gets even weirder, right? Because if it's a replicator, what could possibly happen? So here is Lieutenant Sulu from Star Trek. So let's say Sulu is recruited to go do some work, okay? So he's going to be recruited to go to a distant planet. So Sulu walks into the transporter within his ship, and he's sent out to Mars to go do some reconnaissance, okay? Psychological continuity would say the Sulu that's on Mars is numerically identical to the Sulu that stepped into the transporter Right? Because you can see a chain of person stages linked by memory. Right? In other words, Sulu in, on Mars that walked out of the transporter remembers having walked in. And we can link that person to who they were before they joined the academy, before they were, went to college, before they went to high school. Right? We, can, we can link all of those memories together and go, oh yeah, that, that five-year-old Sulu is the same person that just walked out onto Mars. But because it's a replicator, what if whoever he works for decides we need more labor? So not only will we transport Sulu to Mars, but at the same time, since we can do it, we're going to replicate Sulu and transport Sulu also to Venus at the same time. So Sulu walks in, was copied and then reconstructed in Mars, and then also at the same time reconstructed in Venus. So we have two Sulus walking around. Well, what's the problem for psychological continuity theorists? The problem is, based upon their theory, it's kind of hard to say where Sulu is now, isn't it? I mean, where is he? Where is the person that walked into the transporter? If this is you, you walk into the transporter, and then you walk out, and then there's a you on Mars and a you on Venus. Well, where did you go? Where did the you that walked into the transporter go? Now, you might go, this is kind of crazy, right? We don't have transporters, and this is insane. This would never happen. Well, I'll bring you back to the whole idea of thought experiments. We use thought experiments that may be kind of out there and strange just to get outside of our normal biases of things, right? But in this case, it may not be so sci-fi-ish, right? Because this is something that actually happens with cells. Have you ever heard of cell fission? You know, cells, as we develop, 
cells split. Same DNA, one cell becoming two, and then two becoming four, right? Is that right? Two becoming four, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Well, where did the original cell go? Which cell exists after, where did the original, where did the original cell go after it splits? I mean, what are the possibilities there? Okay, well, that's cells. Maybe that's not applicable to people. Well, let's take a look at people. And this is what Derek Parfit brings up in your readings for today. He brings up the whole case of split brain scenarios. So Derek Parfit's a British philosopher. And in the readings, he talks about cases where you know, this is real life stuff where we have to sever the tie between the two hemispheres of your brain, right? If you're not familiar, your brain is comprised of two hemispheres. And the two hemispheres are, they talk to each other through a major freeway of communication called the corpus callosum. So there are cases where we have to split the two hemispheres, right? And Derek Parfit brings up these cases to question our fundamental assumptions about personal identity. So I showed you, I had you watch a video of a real life case. Here's Cameron, a young girl who was living her life and slowly she had this issue where she would uh, you know, be completely uh, overwhelmed by her brain and she would go into seizures and it completely took control of her life. So it was determined that the best course of action would be to cut the corpus callosum and remove half of her brain. So they remove half of her brain and she has to go through therapy because you know that one half of her brain that was removed did stuff. So they had to train Cameron to walk again, to talk again, to move naturally again. And eventually, as you saw in the video, she seemed to be much in a better shape than she was prior to the surgery. What does your intuition say about the Cameron post-surgery versus the Cameron pre-surgery? If Cameron was there prior to the surgery, which, you know, seems like, yeah, yeah, of course she was there prior to the surgery. Well, was Cameron still there after they removed half of her brain? Is that still Cameron? I mean, what does your gut say? Does your gut say, no, 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 it's a different, that's not Cameron anymore? Or do you say, no, no, Cameron's still around. She just has, she just has half of her brain missing. For a lot of us, it's intuitive. No, no, she's here. She's just in a better shape. She's, she's just doing much better than she was before. But notice what her parents said, or particularly her father. Um, when asked, you know, is this still your little girl? Is she still here? The father says, yeah, yeah, she's still, this is, this is Cameron now. I feel like I've, I've gotten my daughter back. What, wait, what do you mean back? the implication there was that when she was suffering from all those seizures, she was gone. That wasn't really her. But is that necessarily true? Is was the girl that eventually had to go to surgery, not his daughter, not the daughter he knew from a few years ago or the one that was just born because after the surgery, this, this, the original Cameron came back to him because if that's the case, think about what that implies. Does that imply that there was a girl that was put into surgery and whoever that was was killed <laughs> in order to get the original Cameron back? Is that what happened? Okay, well, let's think about for you. I mean, if this was you and you had half of your brain destroyed, right? They took out half your brain and it's gone um, and you're only left with half, would you say you're still alive? Or would you say, no, that, that's not me anymore? I'm not there anymore. I'd be gone, right? Let's say you suffered from these seizures and then you had to remove half of your hemisphere and, and get that destroyed and you're only left with one. Would you go, yes, please give me the operation because I want to live a better life. Or would you go, please don't do that because I don't want to die. <laughs> I, don't, I want to still exist. I mean, for a lot of people, it feels as if you take out one half of the hemisphere and you're still there. It feels like Cameron is still there. What's the, what's the answer according to psychological continuity? Well, uh, it seems as if Cameron has some memories of her past self, maybe not, maybe not all her memories, but some. 
So it seems as if we can still link her, right, through successive chains of memory to the Cameron that her parents, you know, held in their arms when she was born. So psychological continuity would say, no, still the same person. Cameron, after the operation, half of her brain removed and destroyed, still the same person. But wait a minute, says Parfit. What if, what if the other hemisphere that was removed wasn't actually discarded? Now, where did you go? Let's say you get into an accident and your body is, is unable to support your brain. What if one half of your hemisphere was saved and goes into a body that can support it? But then what if somehow scientists and doctors were able to take the other half and also put it into a different body? So where did you go? What's the, what's, what feels like the right answer here? Are you still around? Did you go to this body? Is that who you are now? Or did you go to this body? Is that who you are? Where did you go? Who are you? Which one is you? So, Parfit says, look, there's only three possibilities here, right? There's only three possible answers if you're a psychological continuity theorist, and none of them make any sense. He says, either you are going to be both people, you're going to be one of them, right? You're either um, your left hemisphere person or your right hemisphere person, or in Sulu's case, the person on Mars or the person on Venus, it's only one of them, or you're going to be neither of them. Aren't those the only possibilities, right? You're either going to be one of the, one of the two surviving people, you're going to be um, both of them, or you're not going to survive. It's going to be neither of you. A possible midterm question would be for you to explain why Parfit believes none of these answers make any sense. So let's take a look at each of these. The first possibility, you're going to be both people. Why does it make no sense to say you're going to be both people after the operation or after you get transported into different places? Parfit goes, well, wait a minute. And you know, by the way, you probably don't even have to read Parfit to see the problem with this, right? So left hemisphere is put into body number one, right hemisphere is put into body number two. Once they're put into two different bodies, they're each going to have different experiences. It seems as if each are going to have different, you know, consciousnesses. It feels as if, you know, body number one is going to go to Disneyland tomorrow and, and do some rides. Body number two is going to go study for the philosophy exam. It seems like there's two separate people now. How can you say they're, they're both you? How can you say you're in both? That doesn't make any sense. Two distinct lives. Just imagine you go in the operation, you wake up. Where would you be? Can you imagine going to the operation, waking up, and being in both? Does that even make any sense? Okay, well, what about the second? I'm going to be one of them. Okay, well, Parfit says, okay, fine. Well, which one? Wh which one will you be in? I mean, they're each going to have memories, supposedly, right? Maybe bits and pieces. They're each going to have some memories of you before the operation. So they both have equal claim to being the original you. So which one would you be? How could you say it's by number one? How could you say it's by number two? They both, if you're a psychological continuity theorist, may have memories leading back to when before you stepped into the operation or stepped onto the replicator to be replicated in two different places. But that doesn't make any sense either. Well, how about the last one? I'm going to be neither of them. What's the issue here? What's the issue of saying once you step into the operation, once you go into the operation and they split your brains, put you into two different bodies, that you're not going to exist anymore? Well, Parfit says that's, that's like grossly misleading. I mean, just think about the implication there. When you walk in, you're saying, man, I want to survive. I want to make sure I can you know, do right by my family. Uh, I want to make sure that uh, I do this operation so that I can contribute to society, take care of my parents, take care of my kids, fulfill my dreams. Well, supposedly, once you do the operation, aren't all those things still in play? 
mean, your dreams were in your brain, your goals were in your brain, your desire to help your parents were in your brain, your desire to be a citizen, a good citizen is in your brain. So when they split your brains, put you into two people, your desires, your goals, your aspirations, they should still be there, <laughs> right? So how does it make sense to say you'll be neither of them? If you're a psychology continuity theorist, each of those hemispheres still remember something about the past self. So are you really gone? Let's put it this way. If you think back to the Cameron situation, Cameron goes to her surgery, right? One half of her brain is removed, and a lot of us say, she made it, right? A lot of, our intu a lot of us will have an intuition that says, Cameron survived. She's still around. And from what we see, she seems to be in a better shape. What if later we discover that the doctor and other scientists kind of fooled everyone and they actually kept the other hemisphere and in fact, not only they keep it, they put it into a different body that's functioning and doing stuff in the world. If we discovered that, if we found out the other hemisphere was still around, would we go, oh, I guess Cameron is dead now. Just because they found another hemisphere walking around in a body? And does that make any sense to say, Oh, Cameron, I thought you existed this morning, but, you know, I got a call saying your other hemisphere is still around, so I guess you no longer exist. <laughs> so let's summarize these, right? The problem with the first scenario is that because of the transitivity identity, so if you're not familiar with mathematics, if A equals C and B equals C, then A equals B, right? That's the property of transitivity. Right. So if I said um, 2 plus 2 equals 4 and 3 plus 1 equals 4, that must mean 2 plus 2 equals 3 plus 1, right? That's transitivity. So that's, that's what we see here. Because of psychological continuity, one half of the brain can say it's you because it has memories linking itself to you. The other half has, can say it's you, because it has memories linking itself to you. Well, then they both should be the same person, which makes no sense because you literally become two different people living in the world having different experiences. Problem number two is created because both individuals, your left hemisphere person and your right hemisphere person, they both have equal claim to being the original you. Because according to psychological continuity, it's all just about being linked by person stages, linked by memory. Problem number three, it's silly to think you're gone just because the other half of your brain survived the surgery. That seems like a weird criteria for saying, oh, sorry, you don't exist anymore. So what gives, asked Parfit. Well, one thing he mentions is he says, look, when we take a look at psychological continuity, let, let's just say we believe it. If we take a look at psychological continuity as a essential property for personal identity, doesn't it seem like it's a matter of degree? If we take a look at ourselves and compare ourselves to who we were yesterday, there's a strong tie there maybe because we remember more stuff from yesterday. There's a strong tie there because that's really close to who we are right now. But if we compare ourselves to who we were 10 years ago, we don't remember as much from that person. And that link of memories leading up to us today, well, I mean, it's there, but, but are we really that close to that person 10 years ago as we are to the person like yesterday? Well, no, I'm much closer to the person that was around yesterday, right? I mean, I'm much closer to being that person than I am to being that person from 10 years ago. So he uses an analogy to make this point. Let's imagine you, you're writing your will and you decide, hey, I'm going to leave. I want to leave most of my possessions to my close family, right? I'll leave most of my stuff to my, my spouse, maybe to my parents and, and everything else to my kids. Okay. Most of us, we go, yeah, it makes sense, right? It makes sense you're leaving it to them. Those are the people that you care about most and who's been closest to you, right? It makes sense. 
But then, you know, somebody in your family gets hold of your will um, and uh, you get phone calls from like your, your cousins and then you get phone calls from yeah, your um, third niece twice removed who calls you up and go, hey man, I'm family too, get me on the will. Well, they're all family. <laughs> they're all related to you. But doesn't it make sense that you are justified in giving more of your money to those who are closest to you, right? To your closest relatives? Yeah, that seems to make sense that you're justified in giving most of your inheritance to your closest relatives. So being a relative is just a trivial truth in that scenario. Yeah, it's true that that cousin way over there, I haven't seen for like 30 years, is a cousin. But it's trivial in this case, right? I am much more justified in giving money or in uh, giving the inheritance to people that are closer to me. So it's a trivial truth that they're related. Prophet says, well, take a look at personal identity, right? You are closer to who you were five minutes ago than you are to the person that you know, went to grade school. You are closer to the person that was around uh, at the beginning of this video you know, that pressed play than you are to the kid in the photos that came out of their mother's womb. Now, are you numerically the same person? Under psychological continuity, sure, says Parfit. But let's admit, it's just a matter of degree, isn't it? You, you really aren't that close to that infant anymore, right? It's just a technicality to say that you are that person. So personal identity, just like with inheritance, we can say, hey, look, numerical identity, sure. I am numerically identical to that baby photo, to that person in the baby photo, but that's trivial. I'm not, I'm not nearly anywhere close to being that person. But I guess it's technically true I'm that person. It's a trivial truth. What you think Parfit would say then about the Tukey Williams case? Numerically, they may be identical, but I mean, they're really far removed from being that person. It's like comparing, it's like, it's like your third cousin twice removed saying, I'm, re I'm related, but it doesn't matter. So this is Parfit's take on psychological continuity, right, and its implications. But if you remember about towards the end of that reading, it seems as if he's even denying this, right? We take a look at personal identity, and we see that we have lots of issues. We can't identify the essential property, right? The whole idea of psychological continuity, what most of us feel like, yeah, that should work. Well, that leads to all these contradictions. When we take a look at the split brain cases, when we take a look at the replicator cases, it seems like we can't pin it down, right? Is it the body? Is it the memory? Is it psychological continuity? It seems like we can't figure out the right answer because they all have problems. So why? Why do we have such problems with psychological, with uh, personal identity? Why do you have problems finding out what's the thing that makes me me over time? And a bigger question to ask is then, what's Parfit's conclusion about this? Well. Though all those previous answers have problems, well, then Parfit, tell me, what, what do you think the answer is? What is it that makes me me over time? He may not spell it explicitly in the reading I gave you, but towards the end, he says something about, yeah, but my goal really here is to show that there's an even more fundamental assumption that should be questioned. The reason why none of the theories we come up with work when placed under a microscope and scrutinized, says Parfit, is because we're trying to prove something that doesn't exist. Prophet says the reason we have trouble with personal identity is because if you think about it, if you really think about who you are and whether there's something that exists through time, he says, well, I don't think there is anything. There is no you that persists through time. So no wonder we have problems answering this question of who are you? What makes you you? Because there is no you, says Parfit.